Welcome everybody for joining us. This is our second part of our, our series throughout 2021, looking at uh, digital transformation in higher education. We're really, really excited to have everybody be part of this conversation today. I know this is a topic that I get asked about all the time. It's something that we know is really important to lots of folks. And the fact that we have nearly a thousand registrants at this event says a whole lot about how important it is. So to take us through this massively important topic, we have a huge powerhouse of expertise with us. We've got Lucy Blakemore, who leads up the higher ed digital transformation work here at Holland IQ. Hey, Lucy. And my bosses, our co-CEOs, Maria Spees and Patrick Brothers. Hey, guys. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, and I'm Bethany Hogan. I'm responsible for the client experience team here at Holland IQ, and I'm really excited to hear from these guys. This session promises to be a really great one. Can't wait to dive in. Um, we always get asked right away, is this being recorded? It's absolutely essential that I see this afterward, and we can assure you that it is being recorded, and you will get a recording soon afterward in your inbox. Uh, we're also going to be opening up chat throughout the session, so do feel free to jump in with questions. We'll do our very best to answer them throughout, too. OK, let's start the poll. Pat, you want to take us through? Oh, you're muted. Sorry, Pat, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> All right, that'll help. Um, thanks so much, Beth. I mean, chat's going crazy. That's what I was remarking at um, quietly, if you could, if you could lip read. Um, look, we've, we've got a jam-packed session. One of the things we'll be doing throughout the next 45 minutes is you will be joining our global research. We've already had uh, professionals from over 60 countries around the world informing our research on the digital transformation, and all of you today will be joining that as well. So to warm us up, I'm going to get us going with a poll that you're going to see on your screen here. The question is whether or not, or to what extent rather, your institution sees alternative and micro credentials as an important strategy for the future. Hopefully you can see that poll showing up now in your polls tab. Please everyone jump in. To what extent does your institution see alternative and micro credentialing as an important strategy for the future? All of these results will, will join our research that we've been conducting already. Um, I suspect, I mean, we're dying to share what we've learned already and, and it's exciting that everyone gets to see this real time through the session as well. So uh, as with all good 21st century learning, you're gonna be doing some work during this session as well. So back to you, Beth. Amazing. Okay, really excited to see those results come in. Just a quick context setting for anyone who uh, this might be their first time joining this webinar series. Uh, this is a huge priority for us at Holland IQ throughout 2021. We're gonna start by really making sure we lay a, a really great foundation by focusing on deep dives, six sessions, that's part one, looking at each of these really important components of this topic. Then we're going to shift over later in the year, looking at some case studies of platforms and technologies that are really helping shape digital transformation. And then we're going to hear from leaders and universities as they think about how they evaluate and implement and strategize around these topics. So really excited to continue this throughout the year. And assuming that probably some folks have some familiarity with us but if you're new to holland iq welcome it's really great to see you here we are the world's leading education market intelligence we work with leaders in government technology investment academia learner experience to help shape strategy and drive what we consider some of the most important decisions in the world so we're really excited to work with those partners and have you on this conversation today and super quick agenda so um and I, I'm just trying to rush and hear from these guys because I know everyone's waiting on the edge of their seat. Um, we're going to start by getting a, a little bit more context about the digital capability framework. So Lucy's going to take us through that. Then we're going to hear from Maria looking at context and drivers. Then we're going to hear from Patrick going through some really exciting segmentation and sizing that I know a lot of folks have been anxiously waiting to see. And then we're going to close out with some potential scenarios, potential things we see happening in the horizon. So very exciting session. Um, I think that's it. I'll hand over to Lucy. Awesome. 
Thank you very much, Beth. Um, so I'm just going to take a few minutes, um, whether you were here a couple of weeks ago or not, just for a refresher on the digital capability framework. Now, this is this is kind of our, I don't want to say Bible, this is what we keep coming back to. Um, it's the structure that um, helps with thinking um, with all of this higher education digital transformation focus that's happening um, this year in particular. Um, so you'll see in a minute how we can apply it to micro-credentialing, but um, just for those of you unfamiliar with it, um, you can look across it left to right and you can look across it top to bottom. So left to right is the learner life cycle, essentially, and it's one of the things that's really helping this framework connect conversations across different contexts and different functions within organizations. Um, so it starts with the demand and discovery side where you've got things like product strategy and marketing and recruitment and enrollment, works from there through the learning design focus, curriculum design, deep into some of those content decisions and teaching strategies, then on into the green, into learner experience where we kind of move on to the, the campus, physical or not, into the administration and the learning experience, student life and assessment, and then finally the orange block which looks at work and lifelong learning um, where you've not just got the traditional career um, and work integrated learning parts of the higher education environment, but also looking into industry and business engagement and of course alumni. Um, and the other way that we navigate this is top to bottom. So it kind of, it, it breaks out into more and more detailed blocks. So the top um, is, is the least detail. These are the four, four dimensions. Underneath those, 16 domains um, and they come into play when we talk about an assessment I'll share in a minute and then underneath those over 70 capability blocks at the moment so you can imagine you can unroll that and you can roll it back up depending on what level of detail you want to be thinking about in terms of digital capability. Uh, this will also continue to evolve as you'll see. Um, frameworks are awesome, but doing stuff with them um, is even better. Um, so we've, we've seen with frameworks like this, and I do it as well, you can print it out and you put it next to your desk or, or behind you on a Zoom call and you start all kinds of conversations, um, especially with one as colorful as this, um, which is great. And it's really, frameworks are great for starting to point at things and say, what do you mean by that? Or what are you doing in that area? Um, but even better is when you can start um, doing stuff with it. So. Um, this speaks to some of the ways that we are starting to create tools from the framework um, and in particular if, if you were at the session a couple of weeks ago and, and you join the network you'll have access to um, an individual self-assessment that you can do against those 16 core domains across the framework um, and we're also looking at institutional self-assessments so we're working with um, a few institutions at the moment and thank you if any of you I can't see who's here today but um, we're having some really interesting conversations about how we can do a cross-functional um, institutional assessment where you're looking at strengths and weaknesses and gaps and the potential impact for your institution using this framework as a guide and, and that kind of connecting language for you. Um, so in terms of micro-credentials then, we, we sat down with this framework um, and we had to think, you know, if we were an institution, where would we really be focusing on in terms of the learner life cycle and those areas um, if we were talking about micro-credentialing? And of course, many arguments ensue, which they should do with a, a flexible framework like this. But you can, you can kind of see with those little, the coloured squares, where the focus is feel like they are at the moment. And you can see at the beginning of the learner life cycle in demand and discovery, those blocks that look at product strategy, market insights, customer needs, competitors and alternates, a whole heap of focus in there, um, as well as some elements of the student recruitment um, vertical. Learning design as well, of course, a lot in the, the horizontal end of learning design and then down into the vertical, particularly of subject matter expertise. Um, and if you've seen some examples of how people are talking about micro-credentialing already, you'll see things like, you know, cybersecurity. We needed to launch a six-week course and we worked with such and such. And so we pulled experts we had from within our institution and then we figured out we needed to bring someone from outside. Um, and so you can, you can quickly start to figure out how this framework applies to something like that. Um, learner experience as well, probably just one thing to pull out from their assessment and verification comes around again and again in so many different ways for micro-credentialing. Um, and then, as, as you'd expect, the, the orange block, work and lifelong learning, which when we spoke to people um, last year and before about this framework, it was one of the parts of the learner lifecycle that people felt had been slightly under-focused. 
particularly in digital. And you can see with micro credentialing that it really starts to come into focus. So industry and business engagement and alumni and continuing education really coming into the spotlight in this particular area. I think the overall point about this is that if, if you're thinking about your institution or institutions you work with, everybody's involved in a topic like this. And the really tricky thing, as with many things with digital capability, is how do you bring together all of those different silos and departments and functions and faculties, all of whom need to contribute to this and this not being a traditional process that, um, that an institution may have gone through before. That's what makes it super tricky. And it also reminds us of the, the um, research that was done recently looking at the challenges in um, digital capability. Is it the technology? Is it the processes? Is it the people? And of course, highest up is not actually the technology, it's the processes of the people. So um, lots to think about there in terms of micro-credentialing. Um, I've got a couple of polls to throw to you. Um, the first one is about policy. So um, when we were thinking about this, policy is really kind of where the rubber hits the road when, when you're thinking about how it, or you're trying to understand how important something is to an institution. Once it's in policy, okay, it's, it's got some kind of an interesting role. So our first question, which was also in our recent research, do you have micro-credentials policy in place in your institution? And there are some shades of gray. Yes, definitely. Yes, probably. Probably not or definitely not. So go for it. I also had a peek at our results from the pre-webinar research yesterday, so I'm going to tell you how you compare. Oh, okay. A little bit different. Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's a slight bias emerging to the probably not and definitely not, which is a little different to the research I was looking at yesterday. It was about 50-50 actually between, yes, we've got something, definitely or probably, and no, I don't think we have. Whereas here it's kind of, yeah, biasing towards the negative, which is interesting. Um, and I think we'll probably come back to that. Um, all right, and then the second poll I've got for you is actually what's happening? In reality, never mind the chat, never mind the theory, never mind what we would like to see. Um, but where are things at right now for you and your institution? What is the status of micro credential adoption for you? Are you in mature? Is it emerging? Is it non existent? Or do you not actually know? Lucy, I'm so keen to hear how that measures up with the other, <laughs> what we've already seen too. Yeah, so this, this is actually closer to the research I was looking back through yesterday. So emerging is up around the same, around two thirds, um, saying that micro-credential adoption is kind of emerging in the institution. Um, around 22% non-existent, um, about 5% mature and about 8% don't know. Um, so some tentative patterns coming out um, and that one does match up quite well. So just I think as, as um, Beth or, or Pat might have said, we'll put all of these results together um, to form a much larger data set as well and be able to share that back with you after this. But for now, I'm just going to hand back to you, Beth. Amazing. Really, really helpful. Thanks so much, Lucy. Um, just a quick reminder. So amazing to see the chat firing up and lots of amazing comments. We're really excited to keep seeing that dialogue shaping. If you do have any kind of formal questions you'd like us to address, do feel free to throw those into the questions chat. Um, we can definitely scan through here too, but that's a helpful way to kind of navigate that over. Um, great, I'll hand over to Maria to take us through context and drivers. Thanks, Beth. Hi, everyone. It's great to great to be here today. I have been addicted to the chat and I, I like watching all these comments come through and an amazing group of people from all over the world. Um, this section is just a, um, a very quick overview of those drivers, what we're seeing in terms of drivers and shapers for micro-credentials. So until, uh, and then Pat's going to jump in um, on, the, on the detail. We um, sized global education market some time ago. We resized recently. And this is important because one of the things that we resized on was what's happening in higher education or post-secondary education more broadly, actually. And so one of the things, 
from the $7.8 trillion market in 2025 to 7.3 resizing, so a, a, a slight reduction. The main drivers for that were the tuition deflation that we expect to happen in higher education. You know, we know that um, higher education tuition is, is hugely expensive, but we are seeing trends towards deflation. And secondly, the faster, cheaper, credible alternatives to those big, long form, expensive higher education degree programs. So we're seeing um, faster, cheaper alternatives, which also changes the shape and size of the higher education market, along with digitization driving a lower cost base. And so those three drivers generally are also completely intertwined with micro-credentials. Uh, micro-credentials are embedded into some of these. And so, um, that that um, that context is very important because it helps shape what might be coming and where things might head. You can't fully separate a sort of formal higher education system and micro credentials, even industry micro credentials, because this is where the two things start to intersect. Um, this slide breaks all rules on PowerPoint. I know <laughs> there's lots of words on here. Um, you know, this is also on our website anyway, so you can refer to it later. But what I wanted to do here was say, okay, micro-credentials uh, are, are definitely set to sh uh, play a critical role in reshaping or partly reshaping what's happening in the post-secondary education landscape. So what we're seeing, you know, what people are talking about, and have been for a while, admittedly, is you know traditional models may not be suitable for the evolving needs of learners and, and um, the workplace and businesses and so on. Um, lots of industry providers, including large employers, global brands, we're talking Googles and so on, are increasingly developing and endorsing their own alternative credentials, which are gaining traction in the market in their particular verticals. Um, but generally, overall, the micro-credential landscape is, is is very complex, it's vast, it's huge. Lots of different providers, approaches, formats. There's sort of a lack of digital solutions for the validation and recognition of micro-credentials right now at, at any sort of scale. That's the thing that is remains quite a big barrier. At the same time, um, we are starting to see some early attempts on the sort of the common frameworks, definitions and so on. The, um, you know, we've seen a, a few come out recently and, and we're starting to see a little bit of um, organisation on that front. Governments are also starting to take action. And this has been facilitated by COVID for sure, but governments are starting to build national sort of platforms, you know, Singapore, Canada, Malaysia, even the US, I mean, and Australia too, um, creating incentives for in the integration and recognition of micro-credentials and embedding micro-credentials formally, more formally, inside national qualifications frameworks. And as Lucy alluded to earlier, in, on an institution level, once a government starts to put policy around things, funding often follows. And so we are starting to see this happen around the world. And once once those that, that sort of ball starts rolling, um, you know, it, it, it starts moving in a particular direction. And so with that sort of context, we are, um, you know, th there is a great opportunity for more traditional providers of post-secondary education higher education, um, to enter this market, to be part of this micro-credential um, space. Um, there's a, quite a lot of commentary out there in the market about whether, for example, universities should be part of this or not. Um, and so we're seeing some pulling and pushing in this, in this market right now in this context. Um, the question I have for you, the, the, the um, question for, for the audience is around, what do you think is the top barrier to the scaled adoption of micro-credentials? Um, is the top barrier, it's just like totally complex and there's just too much happening, a lack of understanding of what micro-credentials are, a lack of trust in some micro-credentials, or constraints in the recognition and quality assurance of micro-credentials? What do you think is the greatest barrier to a broad scale adoption and acceptance of micro-credentials in the post-secondary landscape? And so what we're seeing here in the poll, and I don't know actually whether you can see the results of this poll or not, so let me commentate over the top. Um, you know, constraints in the recognition and quality assurance is, you know, two thirds so far. People say, well, you know, that is the, the top barrier to scaled adoption of micro-credentials. And then the other, the other um, choices are much smaller, 
lack of understanding of what micro credentials are being second. And so, um, you know, constraints in recognition, quality assurance, and that speaks to trust as well, I guess. Part of this, of course, is that none of these barriers are, none of these, all of these barriers can be overcome. Um, it requires some some movement on some some the, the part of multiple stakeholders, but actually they are all also um, definitely able to be overcome. So it's a super interesting space right now. Let me just jump over to Pat and introduce because um, this is the this section with Patrick is the is the sort of guts of the presentation in in terms of segmentation and sizing of the micro credentials um, market. Awesome, thanks, Maria. Uh, it's just so wonderful to see all the chat and the questions. I'm getting anxiety not being able to answer all those questions. So we're going to do our best to include them verbally and, and document them um, in the channel on the way through. Um, and we are going to move super fast, so my apologies, but you will get the recording, as we mentioned afterward. You'll, you'll get all of this material. Um, firstly, kind of our frame of reference. You know, the, the first question is like micro and alternative to what? And the obvious answer to that is two degrees. Um, and so what we've done here is just remind ourselves that degrees are in some respects already a very carefully, very deliberately kind of sequenced components of curriculum. This is the US market as a, as a benchmark, but most uh, qualification frameworks already break down um, formal qualifications, there could be degrees, it could be vocational, into blocks um, and those blocks build whether they're credit hours or um, attending classes. And when you go down, if you've ever been involved in building this curriculum, it is built bottom up. It is one hour instruction on topic X, two hours student preparation on topic Y. There's incredible thought and incredible preparation that goes into this. And so it's, it's fascinating just to think about how this system is already built of blocks. What's different about the system we see here is it's very hard to credential or get recognition external to that institution that you're studying with for one of those smaller blocks. It's not until you achieve all of those blocks in the jigsaw puzzle that you achieve the credential per se that can be used externally. Um, and so when we look, I'm sorry, we're going to do a, um, we're going to do a check on, uh, on, on that as well. So the question here and, and looking back at this, from that perspective, really looking at micro and alternative to what is, is do you believe that micro credentials will be integrated within degree programs? Do you believe that micro credentials will be integrated into degree programs within the programs themselves? Seeing a really strong strongly agree and agree coming out here, which is which is wonderful and optimistic and a little bit different from what we saw at the start with, with Lucy's response, but um, great to see. There's plenty of folks who disagree. I think Maria had mentioned before, we're seeing a lot of commentary in the media around some higher education institutions firmly of the belief that there is no home for micro-credentials in higher education specifically universities and others who see uh, a little bit more of the view that we just just provided in terms of the block based build. So with that frame of reference, what we've done here is just pasted on top a few of the micro credentials and alternative credentials that we see around the market. Top left, you've got folks like Straight Align and Outlier who are doing very, very small and accessible courses for folks to get credit to gain entrance into associate degrees and into bachelor degrees, much more at the undergraduate end. We've seen the boot camp model grow over the last five to 10 years. Some of these are very large blocks. You can see Lambda's online coding school, the quote there is 40 hours every week for six months. That is a, that is a really, really intensive um, program of work and you can see how that compares. Folks like Western Governors University built the WGU Academy, again, providing more on-ramps for folks to do credentials and move in. I think that FutureLearn AWS Coventry University triumvirate is fascinating as well. A platform, someone from industry and a university working together, bringing, bringing that credential to market. Everyone here will have followed Google's announcement of the Google certificates last year um, in the press release 
quoted as being treated internally as equivalent to a four-year degree. And you can see just how small that Google certificate in terms of on an hour basis compares to an undergraduate degree as well. And then all the usual suspects, Coursera, edX, FutureLearn, folks like eCornell, um, all more involved there at the master's level, but moving back into the bachelor space as well. You can see Udemy there, just how small some of the average programs are on Udemy as micro credentials. And then institutions like Get Smarter, the, obviously the, the whole 2U portfolio here with um, Trilogy um, doing boot camps, Get Smarter doing a little bit more of that kind of postgraduate as well. But this, this slide intended for you to kind of zoom out reference to that micro and alternative to what and just see the different weights of intensity um, that micro credential and alternative credentials are, are taking up. Let's move on to the next poll and that it's a question for you and it is framed for institutions and that's what will you micro credential? What type of program will you specifically micro credential as an institution? Where are you looking at? They're coming in. We've got a lot of folks who are just looking across the broad spectrum. Short courses is really popular and growing as well. Perhaps no surprise, postgraduate is ahead and undergraduate there are, there's only a few people who are selecting undergraduate. And as it starts to settle in, please participate in these polls. You are informing research that is shared globally across 60 countries around the world. So jump in and share your view, it's only gonna help your peers better understand this space. All and short courses, short courses is still ahead, which is fascinating and, and, and great to see. So let's start to segment this space. We looked really broadly. Um, micro and alternative credentials, as we've, as we've mentioned here, this is really not a straightforward task. Um, in some respects, the way we define this task was to look beyond government-led qualification frameworks and use that as a basis for defining this spectrum that we're trying to wrestle. On the left-hand side is short courses and badges. They could be one hour, 10 hours, quite short, generally no formal assessment, mostly asynchronous and on-demand, heavy video as well. Also heavy peer-to-peer -peer versus institutionally built, often built by creators and um, academics and professionals and experts who craft their own program and share it through a marketplace or a program. We've seen folks like Degreed, LinkedIn or lynda.com, Open Classrooms, Pluralsight, Skillshare, Udemy, a lot of folks in the technology space here. Moving up to boot camps, again, we're looking at about 500 to 1,000 hours of load for a typical boot camp, three to six months, 12 weeks, fully intensive, six months part-time, these are very intensive programs. Folks like 42 General Assembly, Trilogy in partnership with universities, that's to you, Lambda School, The Wagon, Thinkful Trilogy, all, all sorts of um, models here that have evolved. And what's fascinating is over the last year, we've seen an explosion in the partnership of boot camps with universities, bringing these alternative credentials um, through higher education as well. The next, um, which we think is um, important not to forget in this spectrum is professional certifications and licenses. Some might not put this in the bucket of um, micro and alternative credentials, but strategically, it's really, really important to make the connection. These are the licenses and certifications you're seeing in the technology from AWS and Cisco, law, the bar, CFA in finance, CACPA in accounting, NECLEX in nursing, uh, in engineering, professional engineers, field engineers, project management, um, the list goes on. Um, these are generally issued by industry bodies and in some respects, they are the industry equivalent of the government-led qualification frameworks. The, the student support dominated by question banks, study notes and test prep um, as well. This is a familiar space to all of us. Then we get into these two blocks which are highlighted in, in purple here and we've We've made the distinction because we think it's very important. And the title here is, the first one is non-university issued, non-degree certificates, which may seem 
pretty obvious that it's a uh, non-degree if it's non-university issued. The point here is that at the certificate level, and certificate is an ambiguous word these days, but at that postgraduate certificate level, um, we're seeing uh, whether it's Google certificates, Udacity nano degrees, MicroMasters, Coursera specializations, we are seeing the growth of, if you like, industry-backed postgraduate level certificates. Then to the right, you see this category we call university issued non-degree certificates. The distinguishing feature being that they're issued by a university. There's still many of these certificates that are in partnership with the Coursera's and the, the edX's and the like, but there's also a really fast growing and very hard to quantify um, market of universities doing it themselves and issuing these micro credentials perhaps not with a platform partner, perhaps on, on top of a platform. We've seen some of the examples here. We see a lot of the fantastic work in the European micro-credentialing framework enabling this as well. Institutions in the US like WGU Academy are a good example or, or eCornell if you are familiar um, with those as well. And then finally, to complete the spectrum is those degree programs, the accredited programs. These are those that are led by a formal, uh, for the most part, government-led qualification framework. And that's how we think about this spectrum of post-secondary credentials. I'm going to pause there, Maria, just check I didn't miss anything important. Thanks, Patrick. No, that's that's great. I'm 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 focused on answering some questions in the there's some amazing and fantastic questions in the chat. And I'm going to pull one of them. I'm halfway through responding, but let's do it live, which is Elizabeth, thank you for your question. Is there are some risks on micro-credentialing in terms of deeper skill segmenting when industry seeks greater skills breadth? So essentially, what are you losing if you just pull everything down to a micro-credential level when really you need deeper, longer skills? And how is this tension being reconciled? And my 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 answer that's coming out right now is that um, actually this tension is not being reconciled. And this is one of the really difficult issues in relation to the spectrum between the full um, long form deep ongoing learning and the sort of short you know snacks and so on and what we're seeing so far is that micro credentials are um, being focused in areas where you know the long deeper um, more long form sort of knowledge and skills and experience is not needed. It, it's it's sort of, I, I just need that or that or that or that. And so the question of course is, can you really stack them up and make them equivalent to the long form traditional education? We're, we're not even there yet. This is still a very messy space, but that's one of the things that's not being reconciled. I would ask, uh, there's one other question. This is super sort of admin um, but on the top right hand side of your screen you can mute that um, that ping that keeps coming through and if everyone could mute that ping including the presenters then we won't hear that annoying noise anymore um, on the top right hand, hand side there's a there's a little bell there you can mute which is great but Patrick I think you covered um, as much as we can in a short space of time covered that spectrum of um, you know how one would segment that post the, the credentialing spectrum of post-secondary Thanks, Marie, and you give me a chance to have a look in chat. I think there is so much knowledge in this chat. We might have to issue a credential for this session. <laughs> it's just insane, and it's it's wonderful to see. Actually, um, look, moving right along, we're we're not there yet. We've got a lot to go. Um, think of this now in in the frame of reference of global post secondary. The global post secondary market is a two point two trillion dollar market. And I'm saying that in an economic sense. That's how much funding governments, parents, learners around the world are investing in upskilling through post-secondary education. And as Maria mentioned, there is downward pressure from tuition deflation at the moment around the world, led in part by the US market, but close behind is other markets had very expensive um, degree markets as well. And that pressure is being pushed down. Workforce, it would be remiss to, to not include workforce, which invests about $396 billion every year on corporate training and upskilling. And, and this is relevant because, of course, micro-credentials is messy and across both, both of these markets. 
Online degrees in 2019, we're talking pre-COVID, was in the range of 36 to $40 billion, which seems incredibly small when you compare it to the total post-secondary market around the world. And we'll look through it shortly, but alternative and micro-credentials were only $10 billion in total in 2019. When you break that $10 billion out, you can, you can see it here. Boot camps in total, about 0 0.9 billion, $900 million. We started with direct to consumer boot camps. We then started to see business to business boot camps. And more recently, we've seen an explosion in university partnership in boot camps. So a very significant part of the landscape and one that we think will just continue to grow. Then that kind of purple area we discussed in the segmentation of online non-degree certificates and post-secondary micro-credentials. This is perhaps the space that most of our customers and, and, our, and our friends and the broader higher education network at Holland IQ are thinking of when they hear the word micro-credential. Then in red, professional certifications, we think this is a very, very important and strategically significant space. If micro-credentials are starting from the thought of unbundling higher education, we can't forget that there's already a very mature industry led by industry bodies around certifying professionals and licenses around the world. And then finally, which we are nervous that we have really underdone about how potentially how enormous this market is, is the very large and long tail of online courses and badges. We've stuck to professional courses um, and badges. On the left-hand side, you can see some of the players here. Very, very quick qualifications is we've excluded offline executive and continuing education. This is all digital bar some of the physical boot camps, which are not so physical through COVID. Um, and that's accelerating that, that pivot to, to digital as well. Um, as Maria mentioned, we've unpacked all of this on a research note at, at hollandiq.com as well, and you'll get this, this recording after. So I'm gonna jump in with another poll. Now that you've been primed with all of that information, and the question is more broadly, when will industry micro-credentials, in your view, become a credible alternative to degrees? When will industry micro-credentials become a credible alternative to degrees? You have the option of never. I'm not boxing you in. Will it happen really fast? And we're talking like post-COVID, incredible momentum, we see a significant change in consumer behavior and micro-credentials are considered a credible alternative. Will it happen by 2025? Will it happen by 2030? Fascinating seeing these results. I mean, there's about an equal weighting of folks who think it'll happen really, really quickly or never. <laughs> but out in front is you know, nearly 75% of respondents believe it will happen by 2025 or 2030, which is fascinating. We've got, I mean, it's nearly, it's over a third that, that believe it will happen by 2025, a credible alternative to the degree program. Just fascinating. All right, Maria, to the future. <laughs> great, thanks, Pat. Um, there's some great questions there in the chat, so if the other panellists can try to um, also um, answer some of those. There's some really good ones, and um, geo differences. Are there differences in all this within, from different geographies around the world? And actually, yes, there are, definitely. Um, we're seeing in some developing countries in particular, just, you, you might call it a leapfrog, just much more open to what, you know, whatever learning can support the population, let's do it, let's go digital, etc. cetera. Um, young population, lots of um, technology enablement um, and less sort of, um, let's say, um, sort of long-standing traditions in, in relation to higher education. So yes, we're definitely seeing differences in geography. That's one, one question I can answer on the spot. But let's move to scenarios. No one can predict the future, first of all. Um, but scenarios and some scenario mapping helps to think about, you know, what are the sort of edges where, where things could pull in different directions. We've identified four different scenarios um, for post-secondary credentials. So we're pulling them all in together, whether it be degree programs or micro-credentials, uh, four different scenarios based on the sort of axes of 
the, the, uh, the, the level of bundling or unbundling and whether the power of, um, of, of regulation and policy is with government or with market. And so, you know, depending on a whole range of things, um, those two axes are the areas that we looked at, the, the axes we looked at, the drivers we looked at. And so when you pull to the very top left, which is government endorsed, government probably funded, like mostly government funded, mostly government regulated and bundled, what we, what we see is scenario number one, which is the greater whole. I'll go through these in a minute. Um, where it's an unbundled situation, but the government still plays a huge role in policy, regulation and funding, which is the way it is right now, I guess, in terms of funding. Um, what we see is scenario number two, which is micro qualifications. Um, where um, we have a bundled situation, but the market is more regulated, oh, the regulator than the, um, than the government and the funder. So regulation, policy and funding sort of goes together. Um, but bundled, we see professions rule. Um, that's the rise of professional bodies and so on like that. And then on the, on the bottom right hand corner is scenario number four, which is marketplace where it's an unbundled situation and it's a market led, market driven, market regulated, if you like, market funded. So let me go through each one of these very quickly, knowing that we've got a short amount of time. Firstly, the greater whole. So this is this is sort of comes from you know um, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and that speaks to a lot of um, you know dialogue around microcredentials right now. So in this scenario, and we're deliberately pulling it to its very edge. Um, so what we will see in the future is a combination of all these scenarios, probably to a greater or lesser extent, but we're, we're taking it to the extreme. So we're doing this on purpose. Um, and so the greater whole is where um, Disaggregated components of formal higher education are not accepted, they're not trusted in this scenario. Bundled formal qualifications remain the signal of quality. So the market doesn't accept um, unbundling and um, the government doesn't regulate for it, doesn't endorse it, doesn't fund it. Government accreditation and funding favours the bundled degree program, while informal learning and short courses remain completely unrecognised by regulators, unstandardised in format, operating in a sort of messy marketplace. So you can see how that would sort of further separate academe and industry. Um, and so upskilling and so on becomes just, you know, a messy marketplace, un, un, unendorsed essentially, and degree programs, bundled education, funded by the government, regulated by the government becomes the standard. And so that's that's sort of one extreme. Um, the second is micro qualifications. And so in this scenario, the government says, okay, you know what? Um, we're going to define standards. We're going to agree and define standards, establish trust in micro credentials. It will become, someone asked a question about trust a while ago. If, the, if there's agreed standards, then trust comes after that. Um, um, so in this case, the government puts policy towards um, micro-credentials, um, makes it part of the um, qualifications frameworks, the national um, qualifications frameworks, uh, funds it, so channels funding towards micro-credentials. In this scenario, if we take it to this extreme, degree enrolments collapse because micro-qualifications is what everyone trusts, knows, wants, and it's funded. And so that's an extreme end um, of, of the um, micro qualifications. Um, we do see breadcrumbs of all of these scenarios happening right now. Micro qualifications are, micro credentials are being embedded into qualifications frameworks in countries all around the world. Governments are starting to fund these as well. And so um, it's providing incentive for traditional and non-traditional providers to, um, to deliver micro-credentials. So we're starting to see some of this. The extreme would be it becomes the norm. Um, in uh, scenario number three, which is professions rule. In this case, the market is the um, accreditor, you know, the, the, the funder as well, um, but it's a bundled situation. And bundled professional education is where those professional um, bodies. It could be it could be the institution of engineers. It could be um, you know the nursing board. It could be. I mean, this, this already happens, right? Um, but in this scenario, this becomes the absolute norm for post secondary education. Again, the sort of traditional degree programs um, built and 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 funded by 
by government become less important in this scenario where it's all about a bundled qualification leading to a profession. I'm not endorsing any of these um, scenarios, by the way. I know some of them are controversial, but um, it, it's good to look at the extremes in order to start considering possible alternatives. And then um, number four is where it's an unbundled situation and market rules. So this is um, individuals, employers, industry, um, fund, regulate, uh, you know, um, the, the marketplace of unbundled um, micro-credentials. They've matured to a point where there's a dominant set of formats, not super messy like it is right now. Is it 100 hours? Is it 10 hours? Is it 15 minutes? There's a dominant set of formats that are established, ex understood, accepted, so there's that trust. Um, and micro-credentials are offered by, by academic providers, industry providers, in sort of an open market. Partnerships are common in this scenario. Learners and employer ratings of micro-credentials, along with provider brand, become the major signals of quality in this, in this scenario. So there's sort of those four um, possible extreme futures um, for, for micro-credentials. Let's see what you think about which post-secondary credential scenario is most likely. Not favoured, but what do you think? If you had to choose one, and I know they're extremes, but if you had to choose one, which one? The greater whole, um, micro-qualifications, professions, rule, or marketplace. Let's move, I'll, I'll move to um, the the scenario quadrant so you can see them again. Let's have a look at see what's happening in that. Okay, so at the moment we're seeing um, the marketplace, which is interesting, the unbundled um, and and endorsed by the market being the you know highest probability or likelihood. And that's something over 50% of people say that's the way post-secondary um, post credentials are going to go. That's super interesting. Micro-qualifications, again is um, on the top right is the second sort of highest at about 30%. And so that's interesting because the right hand side of this block is unbundled. Uh, this is the unbundled scenario, whereas the left hand is the bundled scenario. So, um, you know, the vast majority of people here are um, today are thinking that actually we're heading a bit more towards an unbundled scenario. Thank you for that input, very, very interesting. And I hope that um, some of your questions, which I haven't been looking at in the um, in the questions there, have been answered along the way. Back over to you, Beth. Yeah, okay, great. Um, really fascinating, really, really interesting. And thank you everyone for making all these incredible contributions and for joining in the chat and just having such great input. I think Pat was completely right. There's a real force of knowledge and expertise joining this conversation and it's just so wonderful to witness it. So thanks everyone for participating. Okay, so quick next steps. The first thing we want everybody to do, if you haven't done this already, absolutely critically important, the first thing you do when you hang up is join our global higher education network. This is a way to continue to be part of the conversation, to continue shaping the research and the analysis. You get all kinds of amazing benefits like updates with the progress we, ma we make, you get to fill out the self-assessment, you get access to all kinds of resources. I can't even tell you at all because it's just so great. So. Thank you um, for doing that in advance. We hope that you'll join us. And to continue with the conversation in the immediate term, we have another session in just a couple weeks. We're going to be looking at university partnerships, OPMs, MOOCs, and boot camps. So a really natural kind of extension of this conversation. So we hope everyone will join us there and continue contributing to the conversation. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. Massive thanks to our speakers, Maria, Lucy, Patrick. Thank you everybody. Thanks, Beth. See you, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye.